Next speaker is uh, Brittany Owens. She's one of our own. She's an assistant professor of cardiology, a bright international cardiologist at UT. And to tell you the audience, poor girl can barely stand. She did three STEMIs last night, not slept one second, and she's here. That's the life of uh, cardiogenic shock, I guess. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, I don't stumble over too many words this morning. All right, so I'm going to be talking about a case that I had in the lab a few months ago, um, a normal intensive cardiogenic shock. So, oh, I have this. Hello. Yes, okay. <laughs> We're not going to read the whole slide, but this is if you wanted to. But um, a 52-year-old man came in. He had a history of a heart failure um, with reduced ejection fraction, and he had ischemic cardiomyopathy. 30 to 35%, he had an ICD, he had multiple PCIs in the past, COPD, poorly controlled hypertension, um, CKD, diabetes, hypertension, and cocaine abuse. Um, so he presented with acutely worsening dyspnea at rest, lower extremity edema, and decreased urine output for the last two days, um, consistent with acute on chronic um, heart failure. So um, he had been taking all of his diuretics, all of his meds, and, but he, he said he hadn't been doing any drugs, but he did test positive for cocaine. And then he also had felt like something had kick, uh, hit him in the chest, like he'd had his ICD fire, but he wasn't sure. Um, so he came in, he was satting in the 80s, he was started on BiPAP, he was given a dose of two uh, milligrams IV Bumix, and he still didn't make any urine. Um, and he was noted to have long runs of VT, so he's starting on an amio, was admitted to the CCU. So then, these are all his meds and things. I kind of already talked about. So hit on his vitals, um, he um, was afebrile. He had heart rate 91. Um, his blood pressure was 133 over 88. Um, so normotensive. Um, he had signs on his exam of volume overload. And his chest X-ray also went along with that, with pulmonary edema. Um, his creatinine was elevated, um, AKI on his CKD. Um, his BNP was elevated. His lactate was 1.8. Um, and he was, like I said, tested positive for cocaine. But everything else was more or less um, normal, except for A1C is 11.9. Again, he's not super compliant with his meds. Um, and so this is what his echo looked like, just a snippet. Um, but uh, it was unchanged from prior, but just showing that he, his RVSP was uh, 59, assuming the right atrial pressure of 15, because he had a plethoric IVC. So again, just very uh, volume overloaded. And he's just enlarged in everywhere. So he was admitted to the CCU. He had very poor urine output despite multiple IV diuretics, um, worsening anion gap acidosis, and then there was concern at that point that he was just in cardiogenic shock. Um, he was placed on melanin and sent to the lab, which is where I met him. So then um, I did his right heart cath, and you'll notice all of the right-sided pressures are very elevated. His RA pressure is mean of 32. His um, RV systolic is 70. Diastolic is 10. Mean is 24. Um, his PA pressures are very, ele very elevated, as they suggested on the echo, and his wedge was 50 or 48. Um, his blood pressure in the lab had shot up to 170 over 120. And um, his thick cardiac output and his uh, TDs uh, also were, in, were similar at 1.1. So I was like, oh my goodness, this man is in very bad cardiogenic shock. But his blood pressure is 170 over 120. <laughs> and I was like, what, how do I treat that? So this is when I learned about uh, trying to treat normotensive or hypertensive cardiogenic shock. So um, you can have this entity called ventricular arterial coupling versus decoupling. So when the heart pumps blood normally into the vascular tree, it's at a rate and volume that's that matches the capability of the arterial system. And so uh, the cardiovascular performance and its associated cardiac energetics are optimal. But if any of those things becomes out of sync with the other, that's when you will have an issue. So if a contractility arterial tone is too high or too low, this decouples the process between the ventricle and the artery and um, can lead to cardiac failure. So um, the VA coupling can be defined as a ratio between arterial elastance, EA, to the ventricular and systolic elastance, EES. 
So um, when EA um, over ES, EES is um, about one, they're, they're both like supposed to be round two, then it's consistent with a normal function. But if EA over EI sort of becomes um, uh, uh, out of sync with each other, um, then you will have issues. Oh, wait, go back. Can I? Yes. OK, so in my case, this graph kind of helps demonstrate what happens. But as um, in A is what's normal, and then in B, we have my patient um, where the EA or the um, arterial elastance had gone way up with the blood pressure. And so this is impeding his stroke volume and making it a lot more work for his ventricle. So um, hypertension impedes, obviously, ventricular ejection because of the increased afterload. Um, and the increased arterial pressure plays a key role in the evolution of ventricular hypertrophy dysfunction and failure. So the mechanism by which a hypertension crisis may cause acute and severe left systolic dysfunction LV systolic dysfunction, uh, even causing acute pulmonary edema consistent with acute VA uncoupling because of the abrupt and exaggerated increase in the EA. Um, so um, in theory, by correcting the blood pressure, you can hopefully bring them back, to, couple them back together. So in my case, too, we also d dealt with the decision of what type of support should be used potentially to help him, given the fact that his cardiac index was 1.1. So. Um, we considered both, um, and there's a reason why we chose the one we ultimately chose. But the balloon pump um, reduces, obviously, systolic LV afterload. I know most people here know these things. But augments diastolic coronary perfusion and is rhythm dependent, whereas the impella is, um, increases your cardiac output by two to five liters per minute, depending on the generation of the device that you get put in. Um, but and it, it physically unloads the LV in. Uh, puts it into the arter artery, so that means you'll reduce your LVDP and your LV wall tension, and you increase your MAP and your diastolic pressure. It's rhythm independent, so that's kind of nice if you're trying to decide, but um, it's also load dependent. So the pump flow is afterload sensitive. So in our case, our patient has a very high afterload burden. So um, we felt that the Impella would not be a good choice for him and opted for the balloon pump. So, um, Yes, so we felt like our patient was like the graft I showed you where the VA uncoupling was from um, high afterload burn -in from his elevated EA, and also he had decreased EES. So the decision was made to start the mechanical support with a balloon pump to improve coronary blood flow and thus improve our cardiac output and index and redu also reduce our afterload. And because his blood pressure was also so high, we also started a nitroglycerin drip <laughs> um, so that um, we could also help reduce his afterload. So um, we also started him out on Bumex. And he did actually start to urinate and get better and eventually left the hospital. So that's it. So, let me ask you, Brittany, this patient clearly is one of those old. Now these days you have the beautiful pressure volume curve that you showed was the traditional afterload mismatch heart failure. And earlier days, we used to use nitroprusside, of course, in a very controlled setting to bring down the blood pressure without going into any mechanical circulatory support. You had enough blood pressure to play with. You were worried about the cardiac index. Um, but he was clearly in a volume overloaded state, and he was responding to diuretics. And you can use an afterload reducer to deal with the physiology. Why didn't we do that instead of going into a balloon? Why didn't I do nitroprusside? Yes, or oh. any other agent to oh. use the uh, decrease the afterload. Uh, well, I well I don't think we have it. <laughs> or at least maybe you hold the key. <laughs> yeah, I, I would just comment in you know looking at this through many years of practice, that was kind of the obvious thing. You've got the super high afterload, and you have to kind of make a decision. I mean, going through the it was a very nice case, but going through it. it, it when on the physical exam, they said there was no JVD. Meanwhile, you I went know. to the cath lab, and there's, the pressures were basically up to the cranium. So they were wor way That's why there was no JVD. There was not an upper level. <laughs> right. <it's more laughs> or had a really thick It was neck. auricular pressure they were <laughs> looking at. Uh, but anyway, uh, you know, and then you would think about afterload reduction like that. The nitride, nitro yes. question in, in our day was always more of, do they have coronary disease versus not? Here, with the ischemic situation, nitro is a good choice. Uh, 
night pride's a little bit more powerful. There were many other ways to quickly get the blood pressure down. There were bolus medications that could have been used, but I, I think that's in a generation gone by. People aren't, I mean, why are we not using that versus putting in a device, which has you know, multiple other issues. But yes, yes go ahead, please. Yeah, I think that just defined me uh, as being in your generation as well. I think it will be the same. <laughs> I, I, I think this is, a, this is a heart failure patient with a hypertensive crisis, right? Yep. And, right. and, uh, and the, the, the data that uh, I, and I, when we talk to our fellows, I, I think that we, uh, we often, um, when we look back at those old data of ni on Nipride, it's impressive it how much cardiac output you can increase in these patients. Yep. And, and it shows really also a beautiful case, shows the beauty of doing the hemodynamics uh, because you understand what's going on and really have the phenotype and, and the solution is, is right at hand. Uh, balloon pump, no balloon pump, I, I'm not sure we would probably, I'm not sure we could find one in Copenhagen if we tried. <laughs> I think somebody threw away the key to that. But I think we would have managed this patient medically uh, as a suggested, probably given my pride in that situation. But I think your case beautifully shows that understanding the hemodynamics really is a, a, the key. a great key. And, and, uh, and, and these patients often improve very rapidly with uh, just after the reduction. Beauty. So I think that uh, just to support everybody, it seems to be that all of us oh. seems to agree that we probably want to do some hemodynamic management with afterload reduction. And that's, that's the main key here. And probably if we do it with, I agree with you also, probably us we will just give Nipred, see the afterload going down with cardiac output. But I want to take it to a different place because this, you know, there is a lot of take. This is why retrospective studies in cardiogenic shock are problematic, okay? Because now the, he, this patient will fall into intraotic balloon pump management of cardiogenic shock. In a lot of other situations, it will fall into medical therapy treating cardiogenic shock. And that's the reason we need prospective study in cardiogenic shock with definition, what is actually the management to care? Because again, I I'm, I'm completely agree with you. And Jason, one of the most important points you said is, we are still in a fight of whether or not we need to put a swan. Just put a swan, you know what you need to do. Okay, that's so simple and that's cardiogenic shock. But also, after we put this one, look how different we are. And because we are so different, all the retrospective study that collect in each one of our anecdotal experience, actually, probably a bias. And the only way to really learn cardiogenic shock is to do perspective with protocols that is going to guide us. Dr. Burkhoff, I'm sure you'll have something to say. You had great pressure while you curves there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the... the uh, the, the, this concept of ventricular vascular coupling and the EAES ratio. Um, uh, I, when you were presenting it, I, again, being here in Houston, I, I just was thinking of one word, academentia. <laughs> who you all will, will know who said that uh, terminology, <laughs> uh, Dr. Fraser. Dr. Fraser. And bringing, bringing this from academentia to actual practical, practical terms. Um, what we learned from those couplings uh, ratios is that uh, you know, a patient with, with chronic heart failure with a low EES compared to a patient with high EES will respond differently to afterload reduction. And with a low EES, afterload reduction, you have a much more increase in cardiac output with less reduction in blood pressure. So um, you can use drugs like nitroprusside with, with more impunity um, in patients with low, with low EF. Uh, you know, um, I say that with a little bit of a grain of salt, but <laughs> anyway, um, there is a lot of uh, teaching, let's say, um, that, that can go on using those, those loops and the, those constructs as a, a foundation for, for explaining uh, uh, drugs and devices in these various settings. Yeah, I feel like we learn about nitroprusside, but we've never used, like in my training, I've never seen it used. Like when mm -hmm. I was, like it just hasn't happened. Yeah, I mean, there were a range of medications in the past that we used to use. You could rapidly get the blood pressure down as yeah. PV loops were starting with things like diazoxide and trimethoprim, camisolate, arfanad. I mean, these are drugs from the past, but that you would get a sudden drop. The beauty of nipride was that it was short acting. The problem is if you leave it on for too long, patients, you know, build up uh, cyanide toxicity. side effects of cyanide. And that's a problem. With, with, with nitroglycerin, you don't have that. And you have the beauty of balanced dilatation. But again, this is old ICU medicine. 
Yeah, just Ajay. Want to make a really short point, and uh, in defense of my Catholic cath lab colleague, Dr. Owen, um, <laughs> is that uh, you know I think ideally you would put the swan in to make the diagnosis. You would start the medications. You would keep the patient in the cath lab. You then determine that the blood pressure is sufficiently reduced, the pressures got better, and then the patient was safe to go upstairs. Right. But in many current cath lab situations where you're dealing with other patients coming in and out you're waiting for the nurses to mix the nitride and the patient's getting sicker and sicker, the most potent form of afterload reduction is the balloon pump, which you did safely with ultrasound guided access and the like, and then you don't get called back in four hours later <laughs> to then put the patient on exit. So I'm just making a practical point that uh, is in defense of Dr. Owen, who stayed up all night doing these cases. <laughs> you know, another quickie is that, you know, in the cath lab, one of the fastest ways to get your blood pressure down is to pop some nitros under the tongue. You always ask the, the resident, you know, what's the level of nitro? So they're going to start at 10 mics and it's going to do nothing. Whereas if you give a 0.4, 400 mics under the tongue every two minutes with a little water, your pressure is going to come down quick. And you can test this. Uh, just a short, short question about... Uh, what drugs we can use in this situation. I would like to ask the panelists, uh, would you use Primacore in this case? Mm -hmm. No. Why this not? is a classical Nipred for me. Yes. It's yeah. a low cardiac index, yeah. ISVR. This is when I give Nipred and start in 0 0.5, go 0 to 0 0.75, 1. And this is like a no-brainer with Nipred. Primacore we choose when um, actually mostly you have a low cardiac index and the SVR is not so elevated. You're a little bit more concerned. Nipred is a big drop in SVR. It's really very potent. But you have high pulmonary, hyper, you have high pulmonary blood pressure. You have high systolic blood pressure. Primacore core will reduce your, your, your filling pressure, which is giving you the same, much similar effect. Or if it's the mid generation now, people work in ICU might, might use. It's, it's, it's I think would be would help. Ali, it will help. It definitely yeah. will work. Yeah. It's just the question: what is more important? Yeah. Primacor will work here, but this is like, uh, yeah. this is when uh, we always have this, uh, in our cath lab we have a poster, and, and, and in the poster it's index. written, the algorithm between Primacor and that, that's actually going to And nitride. you have a cardiac index of 1.1, which is giving you also some more contractility, more than the classic vasodilator. The only issue will be that Primacor is not as short acting as Nipride or some of the other things yeah. you can use, and a patient whose cardiac right. index is 1.1 is congested. You don't know which direction the hemodynamics is going to go, so yeah. it's better to have a control on an ultra-short-acting drug rather than something which is longer short-acting. But I think she did the right thing. Like Ajay said, the best thing is to reduce the afterload as possible, and she, it's absolutely true. If in the cath lab you order an iPride drip, I don't think it'll come till the next evening. So right. that's possible. <laughs> so I think she did the right thing, and that we saved the patient. Last question there, we are over time, but we'll take um, that. This gentleman in the front row actually had a good point that he's actually already on an inotrope, he's on cocaine, so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's probably more potent than Milrenone. Uh, the only point I wanted to make for those who uh, have uh, started their practice in the last 10 years is that when you read about Nipride historically in the textbook, the reason for not doing it, Marv alluded to this, was the potential concern in acute coronary disease for coronary steel. Uh, in my opinion, I don't know if I've ever seen an infarct expanded by the utilization of Nipride unloading a ventricle. And so I believe that that probably is a theoretical concern that we've seen in canines and perhaps mice. I don't know if I've ever seen that in an ICU. That, that's been discussed for years, and I, I agree with you, David. I mean, basically, uh, you know, it's a theoretic concern. The biggest issue, get the pressure down and do it quick, you know, and do it controlled. That's all you have to do. And t use a drug that you can turn off and if you made a mistake, you're not going to hurt the patient. Thank you, Brittany. Thank, Thank you. you. Get some rest. Yeah.